the, in the interview, the interview process has got him the job. Well, I'm not sure about that. Well, I, like, as a policy. Well, I know, but you, you, we've heard it before. But by all accounts, Sean Dyche was one. He got the, the Burnley job off the back of his, of his, of his interview. Out, well. so, well, man, that's why I'm leading the opposite. But there's other one. There's other examples that he's got the job on an interview that hasn't quite worked out. So yeah, you may be right. I find it difficult to have a strong opinion on him because he doesn't speak English, so I've never really got a feel for him as a person. Yeah. And then the only time we really saw him, aside from when they're trouncing everyone in League One, was in big Champions League evenings, and there was just a constant sense that he was under pressure yeah. and very much trying to deal with the Neymar situation and just uh, that weird dynamic, yeah. that power imbalance at the club. So it was difficult to get a feel for what type of manager he was, yeah. uh, what type of person he was. So A little bit pragmatically sad. I mean, he, won, he won the Europa League three years in the bounce, so he's, he's, he's had the success there in, in Europe, hasn't he? Rich, you're saying they're the domestic treble in, in, in France. Is that going to count for too much? I, personally, I don't think so. You, you can put it on his record, but... They let the Division 2 team guy lift the trophy with him the other week. <laughs> it's a complete joke. There you go. Like I've seen, what, he spent 200 million last yeah. summer at um, Paris. He will have a transfer kit. He spent 220 odd on one player, so... Yeah, OK, well then more. Yeah. He'll have a grand... Maybe it was net. He'll have a grand total of £50 million pounds this summer to spend with Arsenal, so a bit of a culture shock. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, you, you probably saw PSG up close and we're not the games. Can you take much away from... Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty much with you. What, what you it, it was almost if that PSG side, there was too much power on the pitch or yeah. in the dressing room. So he was never going to win that, that bat battle there with, with both Neymar and um, Dani Alves. They were, they were the, the real power within that dressing room. That's the sort of message that was coming out. So Neymar has done what he's wanted to do all season. So he, he, was, um, he, was, he was in a no-win situation there. He couldn't... He couldn't necessarily cope with that dressing room in, in there at PSG. I think, I think you, we've got to judge him more so on what he's done at Sevilla, and he did do a very good job mm. there, particularly when he beat Liverpool. Most remember when he beat Liverpool in that um, Europa League final a couple of seasons back yeah. now. So he has done a very, very good job. But I still think as well, particularly the, the, the not speaking English, that's that's going to that's a big thing for him coming into the Premier League because there will be questions over him constantly. And it's never seemed to have worked out for managers who are... Con I mean, Pochettino's maybe different, but the ones that are using the, the translators constantly... Pochettino has exaggerated how... Yeah, he exactly. Is. He understood that more he than... Spoke, he, they used that to his advantage. Like, one day Ramos, it, was just, it just doesn't feel like it's ever going to work. Did you ever have a manager who didn't speak English? No, I didn't, didn't at all, no. I'd say your heart would sink, the thought of it. Yeah, I mean, it's a different game, isn't it, now? Different sort of dressing yeah. room, different dynamic to a dressing room. There's a lot of Spanish players in, in there as well. Travatoni, um, though. Yeah, with Trapattoni, his English wasn't great. You have to say that he wasn't great, but his message—he was able to get his message to us onto the onto the training ground. He was quite clear in that message, so that wasn't really a problem. I think he did used to struggle in team meetings, trying to get his point across when we were doing bits of video analysis and things like that. And Liam, I felt when Liam left, I think that was a big thing. Liam Brady left; it was a big thing for him because well, maybe he had it depends that. who Emery gets around um, yeah. with him. So it seems Arteta didn't get the job because he wasn't willing to be uh, pushed around and wanted certain assurances. Mm. That's what it seems to be, yeah. yeah. He, he didn't want, he, he wanted to say in the transfers, from, from, again, this has only just been, been breaking the last half an hour or so, yeah. he wanted to say in transfers where they're going, they're trying to get themselves away from what they had under uh, under Wenger, where Wenger had so much you know, power You can imagine the, the interview process where they're saying to him, well, Mikel, there is a reason we brought in all these people. Yeah. It's because <laughs> the exact thing you want is what we're taking away from the Every one of them now. on huge salaries as well. Yeah. Your, your job is to coach the team and you've still got to have some sort of say though, haven't you? You've still got to have some sort of say in who yeah. you're actually going to be coaching day to day. You've got to get a, get a feel for those players by watching them first of all. So it's interesting times. Uh, we'll, I'm sure the lads tomorrow will do something on Emre and we might, um, might talk to Philippe Auclair and get his impressions of what he's made of Emre. I'm very taken with this Abramovich visa story. Yeah. I'm just reading it just here, broke uh, last week, didn't it? Was it yeah. Thursday, Friday last week when it broke? Luke Harding here in The Guardian has a picture from 2005 of Vladimir Putin and Roman Abramovich sitting at a table uh, pointing at a map to have a chat about various things because Abramovich is the governor of a region in Russia. Not a very nice region. It seems he's pumped a lot of money into it, though. Is Abramovich at last paying the price for being too close to Putin? Is the headline. So... There's now obviously a tougher stance against Russian nationals by uh, British authorities in the wake of the attempted murder of the Russian spy and his daughter. Yeah, Salisbury. Yeah. Salisbury. So relations between London and uh, Moscow, not so good. So the government has uh, signalled, the British government, is reviewing tier one investor visas. 
which were given to nearly 700 uh, wealthy Russians between 08 and 15. Abramovich is one of them. And there's some other oligarchs uh, there as well who have some visa trouble. So Abramovich and Putin go back a long way. It seems Abramovich recommended Putin to Boris Yeltsin when Yeltsin was looking for a successor. Abramovich had some sway and uh, said, Putin's your guy. So they go back a very long way. Uh, it seems in October 1999, Abramovich attended Putin's birthday. Soon afterwards, Abramovich allegedly bought Putin, then the Prime Minister, a yacht, which cost $50 million. <laughs> <laughs> go big or go home. Can you imagine trying to buy, can you imagine the, the amount of presents you would got and you're trying to outdo your, your, your yeah. trying to outdo the fellow that's beside you, one of, one of your mates. Yeah. I spent 10 million, right, I'll go 15. 50. So I'll that, just blow them out of water and just go 50. Yeah, there you go, have yeah, some yeah. of that. So they're, they're going back a long way and um, obviously Putin's one of the richest men in the world. It seems, uh, Putin wants to kind of ditch the job. You know, he's, he's got like, close to 100 billion, like he's one of the richest people in the world. Um, but actually just wants to make sure whoever he puts in there doesn't come after him and take all the money back. Doesn't wants to, wants to keep his 50 million. Yeah, so yeah, essentially, yeah, he'll, he'll keep power, but he'll relinquish, he'll relinquish yeah. the throne, is that what they say, yeah? And that's proving a tricky uh, thing for him. So it seems um, Abramovich is one of those that um, they're targeting. Like he's kept a very low profile. Had, like yeah. his last on the record interview in so much as we could tell here was The Observer back in 06. He was asked about money. It can't buy you happiness, said Ramovich then of money. Some independence, yes, but not, uh, not happiness. So I don't quite know what's going to happen here. And it seems like one of the reasons they're doing this is, like they quote uh, Roman Borzovich, who is a Russian anti-corruption campaigner here. He said this review of the investor visas is a clever and delicate way of hitting back at Moscow. So it seems the plan will be to bring in these oligarch types and get to ask them difficult questions, as in, how did you make your money exactly? And tell us what happened and look for documentation. So uh, they're describing it as a very clever way to irritate Moscow. Um, so that's going on. I presume Abramovich will get it sorted in the end, but it's one of the reasons uh, he wasn't at the FA Cup final um, Saturday, but yeah. he hasn't really been at Chelsea really in the second half of the season at all. No, I just lost interest in red as well. Yeah, do you think he's lost interest? Do you think yeah. he might have? Uh, he might have maybe more, more pressing uh, pressing problems. Maybe. Eh? Well, maybe. Right. Let's move on. Pat Nevin is with us. Evening, Pat. Good evening. How are you doing, chaps? Very well. Just uh, worrying, fretting over Roman Abramovich's uh, visa situation. Yeah, I was listening to you there. Um, intriguing because we want to read and try and find out as much as possible. And I'll tell you what, nobody knows 2% of it because there was so much political stuff happening in the background as well. Uh, there'll be wheels within wheels working in government in this one. Um, mm. that we shall see. I, th I think it's not just about a visa. <laughs> no, <laughs> I wouldn't think so. It might be a bit more than that. Eh? Right, okay. Uh, he hasn't been around the club uh, very much this season. Is it those other more complicated issues for him or one wonders has he just lost a bit of interest in the same way that we think Antonio Conte has as this season kind of uh, dissolved into not very much as it went on? It's hard to know but when you go to Stamford Bridge you always have a look up to see if uh, Roman's up there and it's actually never been all that regular to be fair <laughs> you know there is long long periods where he's not there and it kind of doesn't get noticed because you know he's got other things he's got other interests he's got other businesses he's got other places that he can live uh, and spend his time and other yachts to live on. Yeah. So he's not always there. Um, yeah. But when things are going wrong, it kind of jumps out a little bit. So the temptation is to say, oh, you know, put two and two together and get uh, five in this one. Not too sure. Um, I think if he could have been at the FA Cup final, he would have been. I don't think there's much doubt about that one. Yeah. So that one will have hurt him because uh, even if he's lost some interest uh, in it, there is no doubt in my mind that he still has interest in it. He does love the football. He's got really into it. Um, and it's a big, big part of his life. Mm. Kev, you were there. Not the greatest of games. No, I, I saw Pat there Saturday. No, it wasn't the greatest of the games at all. Chelsea started the better, I felt, for the first, what, 10, 15 minutes, whatever it was, got the goal. And they kind of did a job on United. I think they were solid defensively. They restricted United to a, a lot of pot shots, really, from distance. 
And for all the possession that they had United, they just didn't do enough with it. They just did it. It was it was it was quite a dull game. And all Pat's a Pat's a big man for his you know for for a good attacking football. We we've spoken so openly this season about City and Liverpool and even Spurs at times. There was there was very little good attacking play in the game. I mean, Eden Hazard's won the game. He's had two or three moments in the game, and that was decisive enough really for Chelsea. That that was how it went. Mm. How did you see it, Pat? I must say, I was watching at home. I just watched uh, there was rugby on the TV, and then the FA Cup final. And um, uh, did you watch the Royal Wedding as well, Joe? I can imagine you watching what? that. What you missed the Royal Wedding? Joe, Joe, no, Joe no, 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 no. We watched the Royal Wedding. Don't you worry. Did you? Ah, come on. No, it didn't. I did. I was a hundred percent. He would have watched it. It's a huge was historical a moment. You'd be mad not to watch it. <laughs> is it? I was at Radio Four doing the paper review um, on the Sunday morning. Right. I, I, I'm not anti Royal Strength. I just not got a great deal of interest, so I, I didn't didn't bother turning it on. And uh, boy, does that offend people when you're not interested? <laughs> yeah. Jo Joel's a royalist. Joel's a royalist. I'm not offended. Uh, by all means. Um, I mean, there is, too, there is too much interest in them. I'm not generally interested uh, most of the time. It was but I did turn on the TV. It was broadcast home. live on, on national TV over here. On two stations. We only have them at three or four stations, and they were on two of them. To be fair, as a spectacle, I think they, they do that sort of thing incredibly well. Yeah. So, you know, it's something probably worth watching just for... And if you're interested in celebrity, it's, a, it's worth watching absolutely as well. Um, I'm surprised but, you no. didn't get the invite, Pat. There was a lot. There was a lot there. So a lot of people in that crowd. Personally, I thought that was probably the problem. Um, you know, for a family, and particularly, you know, the, the the two sons of Diana, who have got this big problem, understandably, with paparazzi yeah. and with the celebrity culture, to fill their wedding with celebrities, and then expect not to be chased themselves by it afterwards. It, it seems a wee bit over simplistic. So anyway, not a complaint from me, but you know, I was uh, slightly surprised that there was only the first, wait for it, 46 pages of the Daily Mail covering it on Sunday. <laughs> but doing the pay-per-view wasn't easy when you hadn't watched the Royal Wedding. Yeah. <laughs> that got to do with, I'll tell you, the big thing is got to do with football. Uh, the main man at the FA wasn't there because he was true, at the yeah. wedding. <laughs> Ray Wilkins wife was there I think to present the trophy which mm. was a, a nice touch. No, it's, a, it's an interesting point about the celebrity thing. Uh, mm. I hadn't really given that too much thought I suppose. Um, but I guess they're trying to stay relevant and young and ah, heal Let's and... not talk about this Joel, come on. Okay, okay. Let's, let's okay. talk about yeah, the real stuff. There was a game, the there was stuff. A game the So anyway, me. what I was going to cool. say was uh, I watched the game and at that stage it had been a long afternoon on TV and in the close, in the second half, really, uh, I str I struggled to fight the temptation to nod off because it was very not very hard not to just assume you were going to wake up twenty minutes later and it would have finished one nil to Chelsea. I mm -hmm. um, no, absolutely agree with you. Um, and if it would have been Manchester United, which it could easily have been, has scored the first goal, it would have been exactly the same game, only the other way around. You know, Manchester United would have done exactly to Chelsea what Chelsea had done to Manchester United. Um, so Conte kind of Mourinho'd, Mourinho, as it was. Um, two big things, I suppose, for Manchester United. They didn't have Lukaku there. And without Lukaku, they had to look for a plan B. Um, and there wasn't much of a plan B. The plan B seemed to be put Rashford through the middle. I've sp spoken many times, but I think, I think Rashford's a much more potent force as a wide attacker. Mm. And I think it showed when he played through the middle that you, know, you need a lot more sophistication um, to play in that position. He might get it one day. Um, well, I was slightly surprised. I thought Josie would have went for the other option, which would have been put Rashford wide. He's pretty good there. And get Marshall in the middle where he actually plays, yeah. where he actually feels at home and find out if he was capable of it. The other problem United have got, and it really was blazing at you during the day, two, the best teams at the moment have got fabulous, creative, number 10 type players. United have got one, one matter. Was it the 92nd minute he was yeah. brought on? Yeah. So you try to you know, get through a defence that's fabulously well organised with a lot of good defenders in there and uh, you've not got a massive amount of creation and you end up thumping the ball into the box. And, and this is this is the this is the core point with Mourinho. So he leaves Mata on the bench, as Pat says, that takes away your maybe your, your most authentic number 10 who might unlock something. And Mourinho afterwards, Kev, uh, basically says, without Lukaku, we'd no presence. Without Fellaini, we'd no presence. And I think understandably, a fair percentage of Manchester United fans are saying 
this is a very top level of football. They're looking at City, they're looking at Liverpool. Yeah. Like it shouldn't really boil down at this level. Surely not to, we have no big lad to lump it to. Yeah. That, that was the extent of Mourinho's thinking on the game. It was. Well, Pat spoke about the plan, plan B there that they didn't have. Mourinho's plan B, essentially, has always been to bring a Fellaini on, as it, as it was with Louis van Gaal as well, don't forget. And van Gaal was criticised so much for using Fellaini as much as he, as he actually did. So that was or has been the fallback plan for Mourinho. That's, that's the way that he, he gauges it. They won the Europa League off the back of Fellaini coming on in big games and changing games for them on, on the run to, to winning that. So, did you expect it? Did you expect him to say anything different from the, than what he said post match? Sanchez, Rashford, yeah, Martial, I'm with you. I, I, I think Lingard, Mata. They've, they've got players there. You know, quite easily, Alexis Sanchez would been would have been a Man City player, and we probably would have been speaking differently about him if he'd have been in that City side, and he might make a bit of difference to them. He looks a shadow of, of the player he was two or three seasons ago. He's, he's not up to speed with anything. He works extremely hard. He's backtracking again at the weekend, Pat, where you could see it clearly there. He was make, But on the ball, he's, he's creating nothing. He's making nothing. It's just not happening for him. And he's, he's spoken himself in, in the last few weeks saying, I'm, I'm struggling to adjust to the style of play, struggling to adjust maybe to the club, my teammates. He, he spoke about all these things. That's a direct criticism of, of Mourinho from, from how he's being asked to play. Pal, I don't know if you, you probably didn't see the BBC coverage beforehand, but Idriga Johnson was on it and um, he was kind of scratching his head a bit on Mourinho because he was saying, I, he, he used the word boring. He said, I, I just find them boring and I can't work out what's going on because it wasn't my experience of Jose, but it's certainly what he's seeing now. Um, I kind of know, I, I, just, uh, is, he, is he unable to coach this kind of attacking football needed to break down a, a bank of five and four, or like, like it's well, hard, he's done it's it hard before. to understand. He, yeah. has, he has killed it before, remember, he has done Barcelona before when he was at Real Madrid. He found a way to beat them, and it wasn't by attacking football, finding a method of defending and breaking. He's done it before. See, when he, he talks about Lukaku, and with no Lukaku, so with no presence, mm. um, he's not talking to me, he's not talking to you, he's not talking even to the fans, he's talking to the board, saying, I need another one mm. up there. Somebody who's, you know, as good as, you know, another Ibra. There's not many him, him around. Um, and remember, you know, he's two seasons out. They aren't all his players yet. Um, but this is the season we find out. I, th I think the season coming, I mean, he's, he's got runner-up in the, the FA Cup. He's runner-up in the league. Is It's not a stinker of a season by any manner of means. It's not been that great to watch. But, you know, it's been pretty close and an amazing season when you've got Manchester City. Next season is a season. By the end of next season, if he's not found any methodology to you know, yes. beat Manchester City or get closer to him, then I think the question is really relevant. Has his time you know, come yeah, well, and gone? We, I think we could, we could maybe even see that by Christmas. That, that yeah. could be 15 games in the season. If, if they're already down on City or down on whoever's at the top, we could see that being, uh, being yeah. quite well, premature. I think the stench of uh, the Sevilla attempt. Yeah, I think that was the one. Has to linger. So speaking of Pogba, um, he spoke after the game. Pogba, are you looking forward to next season was the gist of the question. You can never be sure of anything, but contractually, sure, yes. I can never look too far into the future. It also depends how it goes with the club, how things work out. Asked about Jose. There were times where I wasn't playing. I was on the bench. There was lots of talk. People thought it wasn't working out. A coach and a player don't have to be best friends. We don't have to go to restaurants together. So, um, I would say not a glowing endorsement. Do you know what? Funny, Simple Frank... Simple yes would have done. <laughs> <I know. laughs> uh, Frank Lampard was talking about Pogba. I think um, Lampard made some really good points. This is just a short uh, snippet. And to be fair, he does... He, you know, it's, it's not like um, it's all Jose evil, Pogba uh, jilted kind of genius here. Here was Lampard's take on Pogba. He makes bad decisions as a midfield player. A bad basic decision. And then he does something really fantastic. And, and I can imagine that wrecking Jose Mourinho's head because he's going, well, I want you in my team for that fantastic stuff, but then there's other stuff that's really not good for the team. Well, what he did, he tried to shock him and embarrass him out of it and said, well, I'm going to call you out and a few times mid-season. Um, and I'm not sure Pogba got the point. Paul Pogba is naturally more talented than I was. I mean, I, in the box I could get and I worked hard to score goals, but in terms of attributes, he had a run all over me. He's got better feet in terms of how he can dribble with it. But there's no point in dribbling in, in your own half as a midfield player, unless you really have to to get out of trouble. So all that kind of flick and roll of the studs and all that stuff looks great. Uh, I'm not a big advocate for that. And uh, you see a lot of young players go, oh my God, look at that on YouTube, it's amazing. And I, I don't like it. His numbers are not good enough. I'm worried that Pogba can dominate that midfield. So for all I say there, he's got it in him to do that. 
And he should be getting 15 goals a season and assists and dominating midfield because he has everything. Very insightful there from, from Lampard. You get maybe Jose's predicament. Um, when Lampard Does was Pogba's age, he was second in the Ballon d'Or. Yeah, jump in. Remember last week, uh, the last few weeks, mm. I've been trying to make this analogy about uh, Phil Spector, about the fact that uh, Jose Mourinho takes all the little edges off and all the little fre- flicks and tricks off of the production. Mm. And he just wants the simplicity. That's exactly exactly what Frank Lampard says in different language there. Yeah, that's how that's how Josie works, and you can see it with the types of players that he buys. And he gets in, and when he gets these fabulous players that have, that have got everything that Frank's talking about, he just wants to get rid of all the excess, you know. And the excess is the stuff that we kind of love watching. But Frank Lamp- Lampard is the perfect uh, p- person. There was no edge, there was no extras, there was never a flick, there was nothing. There was just always the right thing. Doing the right. Actually, Frank does himself a disservice there. I happen to know he's a far better player than he actually showed, a, a far more adventurous player than he actually showed, but he decided to go along with the Jose Mourinho attitude of, no, no, just do the simplistic things, do the right things, and get in the box and score the goals uh, with a minimal effort. Um, and the people at Mourinho, they just don't get the other side of it. It's, it's like the antithesis of everything they believe in and like as th- are those sorts of players. And if you look back at the sort of players that were his favourites, Drogba, ever do anything special, different, mm. usual? Mm. No, no, just do the poor thing yeah. and just do the right thing and score. Uh, we don't need the flicks and the tricks. Um, and that's what he's wanting out of those players. And he's not quite getting out of Pogba yet. He, he almost needs to beat him down, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But, but that answer that you talked about from Pogba there, He's not beating him out, beating no. out of him yet, is he? No. Even the key point Lampard made was, I don't think Pogba got the point. No, uh, it was I know. interesting. Yeah, can I, I just say to Pat, well, and maybe another one as well. That's maybe he he works in the Mourinho as well. You've seen a lot of him. We spoke about him. Uh, William, William posted a picture that Joe and I found quite funny. Posted a, a picture on Instagram over the weekend where he's he's put the the winners uh, the winning celebrations and he's put three trophies over the face of Antonio Conte Pat so he's he's basically blocked Antonio Conte out of the out of the photograph suggesting that we I've heard around that as well that there is a rift between William and, and Conte United are supposedly interested in Mourinho's a, a big admirer of William do you think do you see he'll move to United or if Conte were to leave it, will he stay at Chelsea how do you see that going and, and have you got any inside track on to why this rift has actually a, a come about then between William and, and uh, Conte I could make a massively uh, speculative guess why it's come across William is a absolutely fabulous player like a world class player and he's not going to game and this is a World Cup season and he must have been really fearful of losing that position uh, in, the, in the Brazilian side or in the Brazilian squad. Um, for about half a season, a lot of us were talking to Chelsea saying, I can't believe what a great attitude that Williams got because he keeps on playing brilliantly every time he comes on and then he gets hoofed again. So I don't know that many players that can put up with it for a long time. They either ask for a transfer or they start mucking about or they just get grumpy. That's just the way it is. Mm. It's the oldest one in the book. Sometimes it's no more, not more complicated than the simple explanation. And the simple explanation, which most managers will tell you, over time, you can keep 11 guys pretty happy. See the rest of them, that's a problem. <laughs> and, it's, mm. and it's maybe nothing personal between them other than that one simple thing. And I wouldn't be surprised if it is. Um, somebody said something to me the other day, and uh, anybody out there wanting to suggest that's me saying it, it's not. I heard this from someone else. Um, you know, David Lee's best mates with uh, William, you know, so the you know, two of them obviously not been in the plans, although David Lee's had been injured. And then it was very noticeable the other week when um, Olivier Giroud scored a goal. He sprinted towards the be- bench, passed everyone and hugged David Lee's. Yeah. And you thought, so this guy was talking to me about this. He put two and two together and got, got the usual multiple of it. But it was very interesting after saying that. And a few days later, that thing happens with the William on the Instagram so who knows if it's the case I can see William as, as a Manchester United player absolutely mm-hmm. under Jose Mourinho I think although you think of him as a tricky player he is very very direct and he tries to do the right things all the time and yeah absolutely if Antonio stays around and if there is a riff which I, I, I honestly I, I cannot say if there is or not because I just don't know but if there is and Antonio stays that's the obvious place for him to go because there was big suggestions a while back that William was going to go to United anyway. It was uh, greeted with horror by all Chelsea fans, um, but it wouldn't be a shock, would it? Well, and uh, Conte staying, I guess, is the final 
uh, question. He's in Milan for Andrea Pirlo's testimonial this afternoon, and the suggestion is he's going to fly back for uh, meetings with Marina. Um, and the interpretation of that is it, they'll be discussing compensation and not much else. Conte himself, even after the cup final at the weekend, acknowledged he can be a grumpy so-and-so. He said, when you take a coach like me, you must know what you're taking on. Uh, it seems at Juve they found him a bit tiring as well. Maybe he's acknowledging that. Uh, is there any suggestion he's going to stay? Is there hope that he's going to stay? Because it just has, has felt like uh, the long goodbye for quite some time now. Yeah, I think uh, from the fans, you know, he was absolutely adored and loved. Um, and it's still very well liked, but it's a notch down from where it was, I think, um, beforehand, because they loved that passion that he showed. But that's that's kind of faded. Uh, I'm not saying he's less passionate, but it's, there's not the show of passion anymore um, this season or the second half of this season. So, And also Chelsea fans are getting damn used to managers moving on, yeah. you know, even ones they like. And it's... They would, they would be saddened, they like him. I have to say, I think he's a fabulous manager. I think he's a great coach. Sometimes you need to take the rough with the smooth with very good coaches. But somebody asked me the other day, what would you, who would you think would be the next manager at Chelsea if, Jose, if he, um, Antonio goes? And it was a bit of me that thinks, you know what, does it really matter that much? Hmm. You know, honestly, how many good managers out there? Well, there's not many that are much better than Conte, right? With the Scudetto that he's won, goes and wins the Premier League, wins the FA Cup. So not many that many that are much better. But there's a lot of good, very capable coaches out there. And if they come in and you look through that team and you've got, we, we could have an argument with this, but Rudiger, I think, is a world-class defender. Mm. I think uh, Courtois is a world-class goalkeeper. You look at Conte, is an unbelievable midfielder. Hazard's a fantastic attacking player as well. And there's the basis of a very, very good team there you actually should be able to go and get a team that's at least competitive getting in the top four um, if you're a anyway half-decent manager. Mm. So if he goes, he goes, they'll get somebody else in. And the history tells you that guy will probably be pretty good because they, they pick pretty good managers. Mm. They've, been in, they've been in the room, though, haven't they, Chelsea, of course, for a few managers. One that's come in tonight into the, back into the Premier League that looks likely, Pat, is Unai Emery. Uh, what, what's your thoughts maybe on, on the appointment it looked like to us when we was coming in today? Certainly Mikel Arteta w w would be getting that job. Unai Emery seems has it now. So what's your thoughts on the appointment and maybe in what sort of character he is coming into, into the Premier League with Arsenal? Um, well, I'll tell you what, I think Unai Emery snatched their hands off as soon as it was offered to him. Yeah. Um, I think we, you and I sat together at the PSG game against Real Madrid, didn't we? We yeah. were representing each other for that one. And they just folded, they collapsed that day. And you just thought, wow, that is most, you know, dis not disorganised, but they were a team that had no balance about them at all. And considering, as you were talking about before, I come on, the massive amount of money. Um, I have to see he's one of these managers. Yes, he did a very good job with Seville before that. His percentages are very good. I just had a look at them before I come on there with, um, I think it's 76% wins at PSG. But to be fair, that doesn't count because it's in... You know, in, in Ligue 1, which, to be fair, they're, they're miles and miles ahead of. So, and they've not had a lot of competition for quite some time. Um, I, I have to say, I'm I'm not hyper excited. Mm, if I was an Arsenal yeah. fan, I would be kind of shrugging my shoulders and hoping as much as anything else. Because even with a huge bunch of money behind them, mm. he kind of did okay. Yeah, and not a lot yeah. more than that. It seems that way to me a little bit, but it just not, doesn't get you, does it? I mean, after this, there's been a long build-up to Wenger going. You kind yeah. of were waiting for some for a bit more of a wow moment. Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. And there's it's not that many confirmed. not that many wows around, though, are there? No. If you think about it. If you look out there, you're looking at you know Atletico Madrid, Atletico Madrid have got a fabulous manager. Yeah. How many of the current clubs in England would think, right? We're going to get the him in, who we will not be able to control at all, mm. and he will want utter control of everything from budgets, etc. You're right, two chances of that. Um, and then you start looking around further than that and you're looking at the old guard, you know, and the other ones that are highly, you know, thought of, you know, they've all definitely got weaknesses. And the two top, well, the very top ones, well, they're sitting at the top of the Premier League just now and you ain't going to get them. So it's a tough gig for Arsenal if they go for a new one, yeah. uh, for Chelsea if they go for a new one. Um I think a lot of them are looking at Pochettino and thinking, I wish we could grab yeah, everyone, him. Yeah, everyone just wants him. Someone's wondering, has Pat ever got the call from Roman to go hang out in his yacht? <laughs> I have dream. met Roman on holiday. Yes, we uh, have met on holiday. Right, that's when you throw in a good line and it sounds great. Sadly, it was in the island of Arran 
<laughs> oh, is that right? <laughs> and oddly enough, I was I, I go there every year, and uh, I was driving around the corner one day, and there were three blokes cy- cycling towards me, and one of them was Roman Abramovich. <laughs> I wow. couldn't believe it. Wow, <laughs> it, it was unbelievable. But as we, it was, it, 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 the, the yacht was anchored off Black Waterfoot of all places. It was two or three years ago, and uh, he drove by and went. Oh, that wave didn't stop and kind of slowed down. God, um, and then drove by and just went home to my wife and said, I've just drove past Roman Abramovich and I've met him a couple of times before. Yeah. But with Roman, it's not a long conversation. Okay. And all the words apart from yes come from you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Understood. Listen, thanks as ever. We'll talk to you soon. Let's Pat. Pat. See you soon, Pat and Evan there. Short break. Roman Abramovich is the Aran Islands. <laughs> there you go. There you know. Uh, short break Kev's going to talk us through some of the other news today including the uh, Spanish squad has been named he'll take us through that in a second Mm. Football on Off The Ball Brought to you by the Boyle Sports app Cash out and in-play betting available in the App Store and Google Play Store News Talk Breakfast This Thursday, one day before the nation goes to the polls on the 8th Amendment referendum, we'll be giving you a final chance to hear from both sides of one of the most intensely contested referendums in recent decades. News Talk Breakfast will have one of the last debates to be heard on air before you go to the polls. We'll also have independent expert advice on what will happen in the areas of medicine, law and politics, depending on the outcome. And we'll be getting the views from around the country. News Talk Breakfast. In association with AIR. Join us Thursday from 7 on News Talk. You're in the market for 182, but which 182 is the right choice for you? You need a car that's reliable and efficient, but you want sleek design and incredible performance. All at a price that you can handle. And there's one German brand that ticks all those boxes. Opel, the smart choice for your 182. And when you choose Opel, we give you even more choice. Choose 0% PCP or HP Finance. Up to €5,000 scrappage across the range or five years free servicing. An exciting and reliable new car that comes with an impressively generous 182 offer? Well, that's just the German in us. Visit your local Opel dealership for more. Opel, the future is everyone's. Terms and conditions apply. Here at Topaz, we believe change is always good. That's why we're changing to Circle K. But don't worry, we still have Miles Fuel, our creative food range, and our Simply Great Coffee. I'm a bit of a cappuccino man myself. I'm Steve from Circle K Clan Ski. Circle K, new name, same people. You should definitely call your ex at four in the morning. Sure, she hasn't heard from me in ages. I think you should tell your boss exactly what you think of her. She'll appreciate your honesty. That boa constrictor would make a great family pet. The kids will love it. Not all advice is created equal. At financialbroker.ie, we're the experts in professional, impartial financial advice. So for advice on life insurance, pensions and investments and everything in between, find your local financial broker at financialbroker.ie. Want to lighten up your outdoors? Well, right now at B&Q, get 10 litres of Dulux masonry paint for only €59. With 35 colours available, you'll be spoiled for choice. Plus, get the 9-inch masonry roller and brush set for only €9. You can do it when you B&Q it. At Appliances Delivered, we love our brands. In fact, the last time I counted, or read what it says on this page, we sell thousands of products from the biggest brands, including Dyson, Samsung, Bosch and Whirlpool. And we're adding new brands all the time, like Sharp cooking appliances from $199.95, Sharp dishwashers and washing machines from $299.95, and Sharp fridge freezers from $399.95. So basically, if you want Sharp discounts, you know where to go. AppliancesDelivered.ie. Why pay more? Off the ball. This this is News Talk. Aidan Gleeson, sharp, sharp on Twitter. Well spotted. He reckons Pat Nevin meant the Isle of Arran, not the Arran Islands. I wasn't familiar with the Isle of Arran. Oh, but that's in Scotland. Confess. It is. It is the seventh largest Scottish island, 432 square kilometres. Mm. So maybe he, uh, you'd probably think that might be more likely for Pat to go every year yeah. than the Arran yeah, Islands. 100%, yeah. Ah, for a brief moment there. Yeah. I was picturing Roman in an Aaron sweater, <laughs> wandering around. 
so we can talk Champions League. Uh, Leon, in just a second, the Spanish squad for the World Cup was named. And yeah. Spies, no, Morata was the big headline. No, well, both uh, the Spanish and Argentine uh, squads was announced today. Yeah, sorry, just get this sorted here. Yeah, um, no real surprise. The only surprise, I suppose, was no Alvaro Morata. He's been dropped from, from that squad. Yeah. Um, lack of form, only 11 goals this season as well. So he has not been picked, but the usual suspects, I suppose, in that, in that Spanish squad, Costa's in instead of Morata, captain Sergio Ramos. So we know we we can't you kind of know it picks itself and I fancy this squad I think the Spanish side's going to go and win it I, I think Spain will win the World Cup this year I think with the players that they've got okay. yeah so I think uh, yeah that'll be it and Argentina of course named their squad as well Noe Cardi that we spoke about last week with um, with, uh, with Tim, Tim Vickery and uh, Dybala is in the squad as well that was the only one of course Lionel Messi six Premier League players in there so yeah they're in Group D uh, well they'll, they'll take on Iceland Croatia and Nigeria so yeah so it'd be, it'd be good good certainly when you're getting this to this stage now, and you're looking ahead in the next few weeks, I'm, I'm looking. I'm really looking forward to it, particularly when you're seeing the squads' yeah, full announcements sure. being made. Uh, well, Champions League final looms large in the uh, short term, as ever. Leon Blanche from Ball Sports joins us to look ahead to the Champions League games. So, uh, Leon, we're counting down to this game. It should be a cracker, Kev. I know you're massively uh, looking forward to it. Mm. I just saw Zidane there saying Ronaldo is 120% fit, which is very fit in my book, Leon. Yeah, look, um, I never it's thought he was going to miss 20% it. 20% fitter than 100, Leon, that's exceptional. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's exceptional. Look, I mean, he's a pretty fit lad anyway. I don't think he was ever going to miss this final. Um, no. And look, he is their tallies man. Um, they've won the last two, as we all know, and they're going for three Champions League titles in a row. Look, from a Liverpool perspective, um, I think if he starts with Benzema, Isco and Ronaldo, you'd probably take that over Gareth Bale starting. I think Bale really offers that electrifying pace um, that could cause the Liverpool right-sided defence huge problems. I think with young Trent Alexander-Arnold and Dejan Lovren, it's definitely the weakest side of the Liverpool back four. But it's going to be a cracking game. Um, mm. Real are favourites. I think worthy favourites um, at 6-5. to five. They've got the experience and um, this is the first Champions League final for all of these Liverpool players. So it's a big occasion and that's why they're going in as underdog. But I'm sure, and I hope you guys would agree, I think if you offered Liverpool Madrid or Munich, I think they probably would have taken Madrid because I think both of these sides like to attack. I think there's going to be an awful lot of goals in this game. I'm definitely with over three and a half goals at 23 to 20. I think... I can't see any side keeping a clean sheet, but I think if this was Munich against Liverpool, I think the German mm. side lads could have frustrated Liverpool. I, I disagree with that. I think they'd have preferred Munich to, to Real Madrid. I think Real Madrid, you've spoke about their experience going for three in the row, four, four and five. Xabi Alonso was talking, I saw him with the quotes over the weekend as well, what he was saying, and it, it's something that he said that I think probably it, it, it fits this game perfectly. He said, I think for Liverpool to win, they have to play an almost perfect match and prepare everything in every detail, analysing the strength and weaknesses of Madrid, yes, and how to tackle them, that, that's a given. But what he also said was, which I thought was perfect, I don't think... Uh, Madrid will change the way they play for Liverpool. They they have a, sp a specific way of playing in the big games. They know how to stop them. They know how to. They'll know what to do, and that's why I think they are worthy favourites because of that. And I think they. I, 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 I know exactly what you're saying, Liverpool, and how they're going to go about things. Liverpool will not change anything about them. And I think ultimately, I think what Real Madrid will do. Real Madrid will know how to how to stop them with the key players that they've got in key areas. I think Casemiro will be the, the key player for Real Madrid in stopping them. And I just think, I think up front, particularly with the form of, you mentioned Ronaldo, Ronaldo scored at the weekend, Bale has been outstanding over the last few weeks. I think he probably will start. So I think it, it does give them the slight edge. I do think that, yeah. To what extent are Liverpool outsiders, Leon? Look, I mean, they're 21 to 10, Joe. Um, the draw is at 13 to 5. I think if Liverpool have any chance of winning this, I think they've got to come out of the traps early, which they have done on numerous occasions in this year's competition. And I think looking at a bit of value, Liverpool to be leading at halftime is 12 to 5, just under 5 to 2. And I think we'll see plenty of action on that particular bet because I think Klopp, having had almost two weeks of a break, I think the Liverpool players will come out of the traps. They will go at Madrid early and hope that they can hit that purple patch of 10 or 15 minutes like we've saw against Roma, against City, that they are capable 
in that little space of time of racking up a couple of goals. And I think they'll definitely need that. Salah, it was good from a Liverpool perspective to see him back on the score sheet against Brighton in the last league game. I think Liverpool players haven't really been at the races since they qualified away to Roma. Um, they've been taking their foot off the pedal completely. Um, but we're doing a bit of a special, and I think it's a very decent one. I think Salah, to score at any time, including extra time and penalties for offtheball.com forward slash boil sports. We're going to go four to six out of two to one, Kev, to score at any time, which will include extra time. And of course, even if it goes to penalty kicks, where both sides are 12 to one to win on penos, we will honour Salah any time. Uh, well, I, I mean, to be fair, you, you look at it from, from Liverpool's point of view, you think Liverpool are going to win, they have to play to the strength and the strength will be that front three and, and, and how they're going to outscore Real Madrid. That That's so given. I, I think looking at them in the last game, I, I, it's interesting to see how Liverpool will, will cope with this two-week break. They played really well against Brighton the last game of the yeah. season. I thought they were back to the high-tempo football that Lena spoke about. They were out of form. It just did they, they look flat in a lot of games. Yeah. And all of a sudden they were back. Salah scores. They were really at it, I felt, in that game. Slight change of system for, for Klopp in that match where he just played Firmino off Solanke. I would imagine it would be the front three again. And he'll probably go with the 4-3-3. You kind of know what they're going to do. But they've been away this week. They've had a bit of a break. Mm. I think he's taken to Spain this week. He has, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's how, it'd be interesting to see how they come back now with that two-week break. Can they reach the highs again? Because I think they probably would have preferred to just to play last play the, the last game against Brighton and then have a week's break going into it. So th there's, there's interesting how you can be for and against it. But Liverpool, we know, get themselves prepared on this training on the training ground this week to play that high tempo football because you know what they're going to do. Yeah, and, and Leon talks there about that maybe 15, 20 minute burst yeah. and how many goals might they score. And, and, and you do feel like for a while towards the end of the Premier League season, they missed the adrenaline of the evening. Yeah, and the floodlights and the European game and you never know what's going on in players' lives it's funny I was reading uh, Jordan Henderson did an interview over the weekend uh, Leon I don't know if you saw it but um, his dad's had a four year battle with throat cancer which mm. I had no idea about and he talked about how his dad wouldn't even allow him to come and visit him during treatment and the only way he felt he could play it, help his dad was to play well because his dad literally wouldn't let him see him for months on end but he'd be watching the yeah. games. You never actually know what's going on with players and, and, you know, emotional energy is so important. I mean, Leon, we're all kind of dreading the thought that these two somehow come out and the occasion gets to them and we get a, <laughs> a, a stinker. I mean, it would be just it's such a betrayal of what we've seen in these knockout stages. They've been unbelievable. Yeah, look, you make a fair point, Joe, in terms of finals. Sometimes we build them up and more often than not, they will fail to deliver the excitement that we're expecting. But... I just think with Liverpool, as Kev has touched on, they only have one way of playing. They're not going to be able to go out on Saturday night and try and sit back and hope that they can frustrate Real Madrid. The only way to beat Real Madrid is to go right at them. You can't give them space. You cannot give them time on the ball. But when you do that, you also leave yourself susceptible to the counter-attack. And there's no one better in world football than Real Madrid on the counter-attack. So... I hear what you're saying, but I just cannot see anything but goals. Um, I mean, the type of score lines that we've seen kind of people get interested in is Real to win 3-2 at 16-1, to 4-3 at 40-1. to 1. If you think Liverpool can win with the same score line, 3-2 is 18-1, to 4-3 is 50-1. to 1. I can see goals. Um, I think Firmino is going to be vitally important for me because I can see him being the man that tries to stop the back four of Real trying to feed the ball into a Modric or feed the ball into a Tony Kroos, because that's where everything kind of gets going. And I think Firmino, he's an exceptional, um, his work rate is phenomenal, and he never stops running. And I can see Klopp deploying him, trying to frustrate that ball out to the either Modric or a Kroos. But look, it's going to be a great game. As I've said, Madrid are worthy favourites. Mm. They do have a much better bench. I mean, if Kev thinks that Bale will start, that might mean that Benzema will be on the bench or maybe Isco will be on the bench. But they've got so many players who can come on and change the game. Asensio, a fantastic player. Liverpool, on the other hand, Emre Chan looks as if he's going to be at least on the bench. Adam Lallana hasn't played a lot of football. He'll probably make the squad. But I think that's it. 
There's no one else in the Liverpool squad that could do any type of damage to Real Madrid. And I don't even know whether Lalana or Chan, who are not fit, can make a difference. So Liverpool are going to rely on the 11, I feel, that starts. I don't see them being able to change the game off the bench. It's going to be a cracker. I think there's going to be plenty of goals. And I'm hoping Liverpool can win their sixth European Cup. But I really do feel they're up against it. Interesting times ahead. Uh, Leon, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Good man. All the best, lads. All right, short break. Off the ball on News Talk. Muscular pain can last all day. Introducing new Nurofen Durance. Ireland's first non prescription 24 hour medicated pain plaster delivers ibuprofen continuously, right where it's needed, helping to keep you pain free all day. Nurofen Durance. Up to 24 hour relief for muscle and joint pain. Neurofen Durance 200 mg medicated patch is indicated for the short-term symptomatic treatment of local pain in acute muscular strains. Always read the label. Eastern Philosophy from FBD Hotels. Go east and relax in our Castleknock Hotel, a nudge from the bright lights of Dublin. Refresh in our spa before cocktails in our Lime Tree Bar. Or go southeast and recharge at Faith Leg, our majestic estate in Waterford. Find golf, a splash in the pool, or afternoon tea in our Aylward Lounge. Whatever you're looking for, find something you weren't. Like great value four-star deals at castleknockhotel.com or at faithleg.com. How do stay-at cars know to brake when they detect an object in front? Or how can you enter and start them without the key? And what about charging your phone without wires? Don't question it, just enjoy. I suppose. But come here, how do you reckon... The advanced technology in the 182 Seat range is really impressive, from front assist to keyless entry and wireless phone charging. Plus, with up to €3,000 scrappage on selected Seat models, as well as easy ways to pay, the only thing to ask yourself is, what are you waiting for? Order your 182 Seat today. Terms and conditions apply. See seat.ie for details. You don't have to be a genius to find the best deals in tiles, bathrooms and wood. Just get to Tile Style for up to 50% off tiles, 25% off bathrooms and stone, plus massive reductions on wood flooring. Tile Style, retail excellence, home interior store of the year at Ballymount Retail Centre. See tilestyle.ie. Terms and conditions apply. While you eat your rashers there, Declan, you might be interested to know that Henry Denny invented the rasher by experimenting with different ways to cure bacon. Oh, a man who wasn't afraid to try new things. So inspiring. I need to be more like that. I will be more like that. Where are you going? To the gym. To the weights section. Do it, Declan. Enter the weights section, even though it's intimidating and you've no idea how to use the equipment. Seize the Denny! Off the ball. This is News Talk. Now, welcome back. So we're uh, largely done for this evening. You were looking at the ticket prices. Yeah, we'll, see, we'll probably hear a few more of these stories come uh, come the weekend, won't we? But there's, there's certain tickets, tickets that were initially sold for 280 sterling, £280, pound, on sale now for 14700 <laughs> So I mean, you can you imagine there's going to be a lot of people. Fourteen grand know, for a ticket. There'll be you a lot can't. of people trying to cash in on this, though, won't they? Not people that even come to me. though, Kev, can you get can you get a ticket? Anyone? Get, try your best. No chance. There's no chance. Nothing knocking about at all. It's because it's such a corporate gig. Yeah, well, that's it. Well, I think ticket ticket allocation. Liverpool uh, being given sixteen thousand six hundred. Presume Real Madrid the same. Yeah. And so what's that? 30, 35, uh, 33,000 You've got there between the supporters. Yeah. The stadium itself now, what I don't even I don't even know off the top of my head what that what it holds, but there's twenty thousand corporate tickets that have gone, haven't they? And you can imagine the Mastercards, the Nissans, all the big sponsors, um, they're all there. So that's mm. it. It's, yeah. uh, it's it's a mad one, really, isn't it? Even if you're a billionaire, I just don't think on principle you should pay fifteen thousand a ticket. Well, that's just, like, it's fifteen grand's irrelevant if you're a billionaire. Well, okay, on principle though, on principle. Yeah, I think and I think to be fair, if you're a billionaire, you've got better contacts than me going to <laughs> online <I> think, <laughs> yeah, okay. to, be, to be looking for a ticket. Anyway. <laughs> Email and the guy. I'll, I'll get back to me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, special show tomorrow morning on OTBM 7:45. YouTube.com forward slash off the ball, Facebook and Twitter as well. Tyler Hamilton in studio. Uh, talking about cycling alongside oh, Lance good. Armstrong, uh, doping, handing back his Olympic gold medal. So a uh, full hour-long interview with Tyler Hamilton in studio. And then we're back tomorrow, 7 in the evening as well, a few different bits and pieces. The author of this new Tiger Woods book will be with us. Uh, it's a really interesting book, so we'll chat to him in a bit of depth about Tiger and a few more uh, bits besides. Tom Dunn is on the way. We will chat to you tomorrow. Good luck. <laughs>